First, I'd like to thank Pastor for the opportunity. He texted me yesterday, asked me to do this. So it's it's been a while for me, but it's nothing new. I'd like to encourage here today by the teaching of the word. We are in the Easter mentality, the Easter spirit. I know it was last week, but we're still in that phase, seeing things get, uh, seeing the flowers start to bloom, and the grass starting to grow, and things starting to get green, and seeing bright colors. Uh, it's, it's good to feel that springs, spring is here, gives us new beginnings, a new fresh feel, sunshine, more than rain, sometimes. Anyway, but the snow, hopefully, is gone for a couple weeks till it snows in July. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it snowed, it snowed the other week, and, and I, was, I told the wife, um, make our reservations, we're moving to Florida. <laughs> and I was kind of, I was ready to, I was ready to get into the spring mode, sunshine, and all of a sudden 20 degrees and snow, and I was just kind of frustrated for no apparent reason, just in that phase. Anyway, very short uh, verse of scripture. I'd like to open up book of Revelation, chapter 21, in verse 7. A particular simple topic, um, a simple topic to where we need to be reminded a lot of times in, in life that things get very difficult. But just to remind you, we are overcomers. We've overcame a lot of things. If you think back in your life, I'm sure you can think of at least at least one thing that you have overcome and defeated throughout your life. But if you're honest with yourself, you can think of many things that you have overcame and that you've beaten with the help of the Lord. And I want to talk about that today. Being overcomers. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 7. It says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity here today, Lord Jesus, to be in a apostolic service to where we can uh, voice our feelings and our our, our heartfelt desire to be close to you. Now, we ask you here today, Lord Jesus, to come into this room, Lord, and to allow your word to be spoken and to be uh, ministered to and allow the ears that are hearing both in, in body and in, on the internet, Lord Jesus. I pray that you administer a touch to allow them to, to be encouraged that you are still on their side, that you are still on the throne, and that you are still in complete control. God, we adore you and magnify your lovely name, and we live for you, Lord Jesus, because we've read the end of the book, and we know what is about to take place, Lord Jesus, and that you have won death, hell, and the grave, and you have defeated it. And God, we are appreciative of it, and we thank you for your word and your truth. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. The two of the last books, the Apostle John spoke much about those that overcome. In fact, it was about, oh, 33 times that the word overcome is used in the entire Bible. 17 of those references are found in the books of 1 John. In Revelation, in the final days of John's life, the disciple that Jesus loved was given visions and revelations that none of the other apostles ever experienced. John was taken up into the holy city and given a vision of things to come. There he shared his vision with, so, with us so that uh, we might catch a little glimpse of what our eternity would look like. These last words of John re record some of the most important requirements of our walk with the Lord. 
if we ever ever hope to walk on the streets of gold or sit in the throne room with God, we are called upon to live an overcoming life. Jesus. Seven times in the space of three chapters in the book of Revelation, Jesus admonished uh, different kinds of churches of, of Asia to overcome that which was in the world. Seven times. The Bible says that John was a spirit of the Lord's day. He received a word from the Lord to share everything that he was about to see to the seven churches of Asia. When John turned around to see the voice that was speaking to him, he saw seven golden candlesticks in the midst of them, and he saw the Son of Man, Jesus, with seven stars in his right hand and a sharp two-edged sword protruding from his mouth. The seven stars are the angel of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. Seven churches of Asia all had at one time embraced the truth. Candlesticks are, are of this, representing this. And they were apostolic through and through. But over time, many of the false doctrines of that time began to creep into these churches. Slowly but surely destroying them, many of them kept the appearance of good, but their heart was no longer in the truth. But God saw, for the most part, I know it may be frustrated and disgusted with him. Through the vision that he gave John, God rebuked every one of these churches except the churches of Smyrna and Philadelphia. What really caught an attention was there were five churches out of seven that were not ready to meet Jesus. That's right. It's about. Let's crunch some numbers here and then let the numbers tell the story. Only 29% or so of those apostolics were ready to meet Jesus. 29%. When you think of that, it's not a very good number. When you when you relate that to our day, it's not very it's not very encouraging. Could it be that God is warning us? When you read that part of Scripture, it should alarm you. <laughs> Take a look around today. Is it possible that only twenty nine percent of us are ready to meet? I thank God that he loves us enough to give us a vision of what we need to do and be ready for his soon return. How many believe he's going to return? Yeah. You still believe that? Yeah. yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Sometimes you think about it and you understand that life is only just a, a blink of an eye and it's over with. That. And it's kind of sad some people's lives, how they turn out and encouraging others. Other people's lives, how they turn out, how successful they are. You think it's something for a short time. But to read the end of the book and to see what is about to happen and how long eternity is and what eternity is going to be like and going to look like, it is very encouraging to know there's a better thing on the other side. To the church of Ephesus, he wrote in Revelation 2 and 7 that I read. I'll read again. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the of parad of the paradise of God. And Samirna, he wrote in the uh, same chapter, verse 11, he that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Then uh, chapter 2, same chapter, verse 17, it says, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. 
And then verse 26, I know I'm bouncing through scripture, bouncing through chapters, but I just want to get to a point. And he that overcometh in verse 26 of chapter 2, and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. This pandemic really, really slowed things down. This pandemic has really uh, discouraged a lot of people. This pandemic had a way of, of playing with our minds and in our, our hearts to where we felt like it was just uh, just going to be, we are going to be locked in for quite a while. I know that, that we have our, we should have our altars at home and read at home, but it's just encouraging to gather together. There's something about gathering together and worshiping and magnifying the Lord. And it felt like that was coming to an abrupt end. But to, re to remember that in his word, he's saying that I am, an over I am an overcomer. It's encouraging to know that the higher power is on my side and I can overcome anything. The church of Philadelphia, in chapter 3, verse 12 of Revelation, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of the heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Laodicea church he's writing to in verse 21 of chapter 3. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in the throne. I don't know about you, but I still want to overcome. We still face challenges, may not be the same challenges we faced yesterday, but we face new challenges and we want to overcome them. Yeah. Overcome them individually and as a church. Church has is is struggling with with bringing brand new people, but I believe that there is still a revival. Yeah. It is discouraging sometimes to hear that people are still. Um, I don't want to get political; that is not a place for here. But I that they still feel like they they need to be locked down. And I just want to encourage them. God is still in control. God is still on the throne. And God is still allowing you to be an overcomer if you believe his word. What is it that these seven churches were called to repent of and overcome? What is it that these seven churches were called to, to repent and overcome? Certain certain churches here had, had different problems. We have different problems in comparison to other churches, right? We have different problems individually compared to other people's problems. You see people, and for example, St. Jude, Jude's Children's Hospital, they have a rough lives. Some of them have a really difficult way of life. But you see other people in very... Uh, that, are, that were healed of the Lord and that are, are living a, a prosperous life through finance or whatever case may be, God has blessed them. Not saying that God can't bless those that are in the hospital, but I'm just using that as a comparison. Some people have it very difficult. Some people have it very, very simple. Some people take it for granted. Some of the some of the things that God confronted them in these churches with, and I want to bring that as an example. He came to them and brought some examples to them and made them face the the, the truth of where they were at. So, for example, the church of Ephesus left their first love. Do you remember your first love? Do you remember where you were the first time the Lord had had, had gotten a hold of you? Do you remember that? God was no longer the first with this church. They put the things of the world before God. Pergamus Church was going the way of Balaam. They associated with idolaters. 
and pagan festivals. They committed fornication. Others in this group were going the way of the Nicolaitans. This was similar way of Balaam. Adultery and fornication were accepted. Does that sound familiar? They were mixing their beliefs with pagan rituals. Sounds familiar to some today. Some in the church, they held the beliefs of Jezebel, who called herself a prophetess, but taught that fornication and idolatry were accepted. Nothing new to us. Sardis was a church that had faith without hope. They didn't bag up their faith with any action. And Laodicea was proud, increased with goods, and in need of nothing. You look at the sin of these churches, you can see that they were facing the same things that we're facing today. No, maybe not this particular church. You can understand what I'm trying to say. Sometimes I get... Uh, uh, I don't use enough words to explain what I'm trying to put forth. Just bring, just bring home a point. It's amazing that a vision that was given to John 2,000 years ago relates to us today. How powerful the Word of God is from generation to generation to generation. What is that telling us? Telling us that there's nothing new that God has never overcame. God has never help somebody overcome something, anything. Whatever the case may be, God has to be. Right? Yes. Do you believe that this church is a church that can overcome the attendance issue? Yes. Which is, what, well, revival, right? Although there is, there is a, a time right now that is a, a little struggle, but there is going to be a time when we will not be able to find a seat. Right? Coming into those days to where you may have to give up your seat for that other person, which, which will be good. Or, or expand or move to a bigger building. The religions of our day are pressuring the true church to let go of some things so that we can we can fit into the mainstream Christianity. I believe we have great leadership to where if he sees something, he's going to call it out. Not afraid to offend or hurt feelings. Not that something that he is, in, that pastor enjoys doing, but he'll do it if, it, if, if it's necessary. Adultery and fornication have reached a point of society that is very simply accepted as the norm. Many in the church have even accepted this worldview, but God said that it is something that he hates. Something that he hates. Now I've been told <laughs> as a kid, hate is a very strong word. Does God really mean? Hate. I think he does. I don't think he hates the individual. I don't believe he hates the individual, but he hates the action. The action, the choices, the direction that some take. Many have lost that love for God that they had when they first came to him. It has been re replaced by the love for the world. And the things of this world, rich and increased with goods, something that sounds familiar, I'm sure. If you think about something, you think of that individual that has been down that road, that is no longer at church because something has pulled them out for whatever reason, that is better off not coming to church. You could think of somebody, I'm sure. Exact same issues that John was addressing 
from 2,000 years ago. Just, it just boggles my mind to think that God already did this. He knew what was going to come down the path. That's why he wrote it in the book. God said, unless we repent of these things and overcome them, we will not inherit what? Eternal life, right? Most of us are here today that have already overcome. We can go through, I can ask individual, I can ask everybody here, we can be here all day asking about somebody that what you have overcome. We can be here for quite a while listening to what people have overcome. Because, why is that? Because that's our testimony. Testimony and saying, hey, this is my experience. I see that you're going down this road. I'm going to help you with what I have experienced to let you see that it is possible to beat. Yeah. It is possible to beat it, not with your own strength, but with the strength of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Also, John acknowledged this in John chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. It says, I write unto you, Fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning, I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Notice, John is writing the fathers, young men, and children. And this would also include women who already have a relationship with God, who already know God, and who already overcome the enemy. I may enjoy being strong, being grasped by the enemy. It's not a good feeling, is it? It's frustrating. It's discouraging. It's, it's depressing. It's heavy. Just just something that, that when you walk through the doors of it, it's not the building, it's the spirit within the building. That when you go to church, you just feel that, that heaviness just, just going away. It's like the first time you felt the presence of God. And some get to hear specifically, I think it was 1998 when we first came to church. <laughs> when when I, I, I first came to an apostolic church, I have said this many times before, been to a brother church, been to a Catholic church, a Lutheran church, an apostolic church is just different. I won't say it's a bad different, but I got to be honest. That first time, it was one of these days. These people were nuts. <laughs> it was, I'm being, being honest, being serious, and, and just something grabbed a hold, grabbed a hold of you, and just you become the number. In a, in a nice way. Yes. In a, in a, in a, I don't know, in a way to where you become crazy for the Lord, right? right. You overcome things, you overcome your struggles, and you're like, eh, maybe that was me. Then you overcome more struggles in life, and then you say, there has to be a higher power that is helping me through. Then you, then you overcome some more things in life, and then you get encouraged and know that there is a higher power helping you through life, get discouragements through life, and God says, hey, wait a minute. I put you through this to give me the glory. You're not giving me glory. It's not for your power. It's for his glory yeah. that you have overcome this problem. And when you give him the glory, give him the praise, he sees, hey, this person can handle it. He can handle it. She can handle it. I'm going to give it give her or him some more so he can build or she can build a testimony to help other people. Overcome. Overcoming. I wasn't a, uh, I was 
19 years old when I came to church. I didn't have the luxury to sit in a youth class or to listen to Bible studies. But I'm thankful. I'm thankful for my testimony. Everybody has a different testimony. Thankful for each and everybody here today. I'm sure, I'm sure you're thankful too. Amen. Amen. John chapter 14, verse 17. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you, and he shall be in you. That is you and I today. We know him because he dwells in us. We are overcomers. We have overcame <coughs> by what? The blood of the Lamb in the word of our testimony. We have already claimed the victory through Jesus. He sealed the deal at Calvary. Now that we have the Holy Ghost, Read the back of the book, and guess what? We win. We know that we are victorious. We know that we are going to win this fight. But I'm sure, I'm sure through life, when they throw, when life throws you curveballs, when life hands you a, a crazy deck of cards, it becomes confusing. Confusing to where God, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to pull? Where do you want me to go with this? What are you trying to teach me? And the biggest one, what did I do to deserve this? Right? You ever ask yourself, what did I do to deserve this? Maybe it's just because of things are strong enough. That you know that you're an overcomer. That he allows you to go through things. Because that people that see you and look up to you and see that you're overcoming get encouraged and they overcome their issue. Just maybe. We tell our kids all the time that uh, when they get discouraged that there's people look up to you. Believe it or not, there's people that look up to each and every one, each and every one, for some specific reason, some particular reason. For example, I'll give an example. Sister Debbie, I've only got to be able to sit through one class that Sister Debbie teaches, but that has impacted my life forever. For the simple fact, she got to give attention. She was able to bring forth her father, and she kept their attention the entire time. That is a skill, that is a burden, that is a desire that I would love, love to have. Still working on it. I don't believe that I have reached the, the potential that Sister Debbie has. But I am thankful for examples in one. Amen. I know that there are some, some that we can say, hey, I like to be like this person, I like to be like that person, I like to preach like this person, or play music like that person. I know that we all look up to someone. There's one huge challenge that comes with victory. One huge challenge. One huge challenge. Let me say it very simple. We must maintain. Ask any boxer how hard it is to keep the, their belt. Everybody is coming at them with everything they got. Every other fighter is preparing, training, and expecting to bring them down. Ask Muhammad Ali. How about Mike Tyson? What it's like trying to maintain the heavyweight championship in the world. Costs a lot. The hardest part of any victory is keeping it. The 2008 New England Patriots, some of your football fans. How many have been football fans in the past? 
How many know football? Let me make it simple. There we go. Okay. How many know who the New England Patriots are? There we go. A little more participation. You may not like that. But it's just an example. Of 2008, they were undefeated. They were 16 and 0 in the regular season, going through the playoffs like nobody's business. Very simple and looked like they were going to win it all. Super Bowl matchup, they come up against the most dangerous kind of opponent. The kind of opponent that has nothing to lose. Who was it? The New York Giants. With less than a minute left in the game, it looked like the Patriots were going to win it all. And with a perfect record at that, nobody has defeated them to this point. The Giants kept coming at them with everything that they had and with 35 seconds left of the game. The quarterback was Eli Manning that hit Plexico Burris in the end zone for a touchdown pass. He ended the dream of every Patriot in the stadium. You know what I was thinking at that point? At that point, I was thinking that is the greatest thing that I, I'm not here. <laughs> that is the greatest thing that I've ever seen in my life. Those guys that were high and mighty just got knocked down 30 seconds left of their entire season that had just been humbled. I was, I was uh, okay with with less, with less than this, less than a minute in the game. They had every victory they could have won. Very simple. They're, they made it look very easy. They had the best players, all the money that they needed. Fans galore because you get fans when you win. You get on the bandwagon. Or you get extremely hated, one of the two. Their perfect season, all their preparation, hard work, and sacrifice was shattered. With a mental lapse, seconds to go. They had a mental lapse. If you ever Google a play, they had a mental lapse. I know that 95% of you will never, never see the play. But just believe me. It was a mistake, and they got beat, and that was the end. Today, I believe that the church is in its final minutes. I believe that the, that the Lord is... is coming back. Yeah. I believe that he is on the brink of just opening heaven's doors. When we are about to claim the greatest victory the world has ever known. Amen. Yet at this very moment, we are fighting an enemy that is so very dangerous. Not because he has more power in us, but because he has nothing to lose. Yeah. He even knows that he lost. What's he got to lose? What's he got to gain? Would be the great question. He's got to gain your soul. He's got to gain your presence for eternity. When you read the word, you will see that Satan is guaranteed what? Defeat. Since he has already lost his battle, all he can do is take as many as he can with him. I don't know about you, but I want to make that with my Amen. I know we struggle. How many can be honest and say, yeah, I struggle with things? Yeah. Right? I see everybody, everybody, if you're honest with yourself, you can say yes, I agree. But let me let me remind you that even with those struggles, you have somebody to lean on, somebody to talk to. Even when you're home home in, in bed or, or home on the couch or, or whatever the case may be or wherever you're struggling at work or, or a home project, whatever it is, you're struggling with, with life in particular. And then you go to God and say, God, this is my problem. You see my problem? Help me. Or the greatest example is you don't know what to say or how to explain it, but all you can say is Jesus. There has been testimony upon testimony upon testimony that calling just the name of Jesus, things happen. God moves, God ministers in a greater way 
than we can ever fathom or uh, or comprehend. You can remember, I'm sure you can remember church services that just blow your mind. Those are the best ones, the ones that you go in church frustrated and you leave it. The best ones are the ones where you say, ah, I don't feel like it, but I'm going anyways. And you leave thankful that you've been in the presence of God. Those are the best type of church services. Not encouraging you to come to church disgusted. Please don't give me wrong. It is good to come to church with a smile on your face. That's right. But I'm sure everybody here has done it. Come to church with just so much on your mind, so much of life on your mind, you just don't know where to turn. But then you leave church encouraged. Amen. We have to find a way to stay on top. We have to find a way to be an overcomer, to continue being an overcomer. We cannot let down for a single moment. What's the scripture say? Pray without season. Pray continue. I'm sure, I'm sure uh, sometimes we we try to fix things on our own. Guilty. Trying to fix things on our own. I'm a man. I, 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 I try to, to find an answer. Find an answer for any problem. But a lot of times the only answer Mm -hmm. A lot of times you get you get uh, uh, discouraging um, news from the doctor. You get news to where you got to uh, be on this medication forever, or you got to, to come to come to the doctor's office for uh, every week to get checked up. So that just gets kind of frustrating. Then you mention the name of Jesus. And then the doctor at the last visit says, oh, you don't have to see me until this next point, which is months from now. That's encouraging. Mm -hmm. For me, for example, with the latest mishap for me, um, you are all aware that a few weeks ago I was in the hospital for a, a condition that I had that was very um, old. Scary for me. I am not a a, a, a a worrier to where I go to the doctor for everything or go to the hospital for everything. But I just felt this time, this is serious business. When there's a pressure on your chest, uh, I don't want them to stick around a little longer. I didn't want to go just yet. So so I asked the wife, "Will you give her a story?" But I'm thankful. Thankful that when I went to the doctor, that after after that, I forget what day it was, it doesn't matter. Uh, she just said that um, this medication will, will allow you to keep, will allow that pressure to keep stay down, allow the swelling to stay down, and take this for three months, two days a week, or two times a day, and uh, should should stay away. And to this day, thank God, I haven't had an issue. I'm thankful for that. It is encouraging to know that when you go to a doctor visit and they give you good news. Every test that I had at that emergency room came back positive. That's encouraging, right? When you come back, when you come back after a severe issue in one, severe issue at the doctor's office, and you, and you come back with a positive uh, test result, it's encouraging. You feel like you can uh, run up the wall or something crazy like that. Being overcome, overcoming your fear of doctors. Don't give to his devices, the devil's devices. Don't give in to his tricks. We all know his tricks. We all know how how easy it could be to fall. The hardest part about this fight is staying on top and staying in control. Ask any golfer what it's like trying to maintain a lead in a golf tournament. Please don't ever ask me about golf. 
<laughs> I am terrible at mini golf, and I can't even hit a golf ball at the driving range. Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm, I can I can hold my own at football, basketball, baseball, and uh, I'll keep on golf. You will get a laugh upon laugh upon laugh. I'm going to ask you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe, I should, maybe I should come in clown suit. Yeah. Because that's what you're going to get is a name. Jesus didn't call us to overcome and then fail. He called us to live an overcoming life until what? Comes. Keep doing what you did the day you came to God. I can remember that day. <laughs> that day I had a dream that woke me up in the middle of the night as a kid. I just felt very hot, sweaty. I woke up. I was on the top bunk. I can remember to this day. I woke up on the top bunk. I lifted my head, almost hit my head on the ceiling. It was right there. For some reason, I know why now, but at that point, for some reason, I don't know why I was awake at two in the morning. Everybody else was asleep. I was just sobbing for some apparent reason. And, and then a uh, day or two later, thinking about it, I know exactly why. It's because God was trying to get a hold of me. And particularly for me, he scared me to come to him. That's the way he dragged me. He scared me. I want to make heaven my home. I know this is an old, old saying that I have repeated this entire time, but heaven has to be our home. That's right. And in my particular case, uh, I'm a, I don't know, I want to say, I'm thinking of the correct word. Um, I would say that I am, I don't want to make hell my home. Reason I struggle with that is that's how I wanted to make sure that I didn't uh, use the wrong word. Sometimes I do that and uh, get excited for whatever reason. In a nutshell, we maintain our victory by loving not the world or the things in the world. Yes, objects make life easier, uh, things make life. Uh, simpler to live but not loving the things of this world that is how we stay on top that is how we keep the victory that is how we make heaven our home that's right you remember what god took away from you the day you came to the lord you remember how he convinced you that he is the king of kings and of all the world do you remember that day that God said, hey, um, this is the path I want you to take? You remember that day? And it was, it was the greatest day of your life. The greatest day of your life where you can say, I'll remember that day. You can remember that day like it was yesterday. Yes. For me, I remember that on I believe it was 323 Oakland Avenue in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. I was a city boy. Greensburg, Pennsylvania, at that altar that had a black cushion top with those little buttons on top. But when you put your head on the altar, you didn't knock your head off a two by four. I remember that it was the second button on my left, your right side. And God got a hold of me and said, hey, I want you to take this path. Come on. Yes, yes. Then that same day, I received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and that day I got baptized. It's very exciting. Very exciting now that I feel like I am on the victorious side. Yeah. I am thankful that, that God has put people in my life to, to keep me focus, to keep me going forward, to keep me thinking that there is still something new in the Word of God. Yes. Now, have you ever read a book? 
Have you ever read a book over and over again to get something new out of it, other than the other than the Bible? No. There is something about the Word of God that you learn something new each and every time you read the same scripture over and over again. We can be overcome. We can be overcomers, I should say. Overcomers by knowing and memorizing the word of God. First John chapter 2, verse 20, but ye have the unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. If it's in the word of God, it is true. If it's in the word of God, it's true. That's right. Some may have, well, there has been a fight throughout all of um, throughout all of time uh, debating the word of God. There is no debating the truth. Right. Be careful about this. Those who would add or take away from the word and sin. Be careful of those. I'm sure we have a specific scripture that we keep in our mind. That specific scripture that we keep in our mind to where we say we say it to ourselves and we get encouraged from it, right? I'm sure there's a very simple scripture. It's not that I'm not, it's not that uh God is saying that you're simple-minded, but you are you have that specific scripture where it changed your life. That specific word that has changed throughout, that has wrecked your world, basically. John wrote in verse 21, in chapter 2, 1 John, I'm sorry, I have not written unto you because you have not, not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. John wrote this not to those who knew not the truth, but to those who knew the truth, to remind them that the truth of God cannot lie. If we stand on the truth of the word, if we live the truth, teach the truth, and abide the truth, then we shall have eternal life. Now, we uh, celebrate Easter because we believe that God, that Jesus died and rose from the dead, right? We believe that he is a risen Savior. We believe that, right? Because we know it's the truth. We have an experience with God. We have been baptized in his name, received the gift of the Holy Ghost have been forgiven of our sins. It is in Scripture. We have experienced it, and we know it's truth, right? We right. know it's truth because we have an experience. We get into that argument sometimes with other people and say, ah, that's not for me. That's not for me. That's not truth. Too late. I've experienced it. We've experienced it. We know it's truth. Yes. We know it's, it's the way to go. That's right. We know God shined a light on us to say, hey, uh, uh, I choose you. I choose you. I choose you. I'm excited to say that we have an opportunity to know who he is. It's exciting to know that he chose us, right? It's exciting to know that God chose me, you, each and every one. Amen. God is good. We are um, able to come together in this place. I'm thankful for that after being away for who knows how long I've been on. Remember that long stretch. But it is encouraging to know that we are together now. Mm -hmm. Just wanting to encourage you today to overcome. To be overcomers. I am wanting to be uh, I'm wanting to be one that is remembered and be an example of an overcomer. I want to whoever is looking up to me, whoever that is, I want to show that I I'm an overcomer, not by my power. Oh, my
I struggle with things. I struggle with with an attitude at times. Who doesn't? I struggle with discouragement. I struggle with self-esteem, me personally. I struggle with uh, some other different things, but God has helped me through. I'm excited to know that I, my entire family, is here with me in church. Well, well, my my family here, my wife and kids. It's exciting. Um, my mom and dad and sister are now coming here. That's exciting. But I believe that we can. We can still be overcome. God is good. I want to, uh, I'm sure how much longer to go. But as I said before, I think back. Revelation chapter 21, verse 7 says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. I'm thankful for that. Romans 7 and 18 and 19 says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Verse 19. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. More than any other New Testament writer, Paul talked about his struggle to overcome. He was always battling what? What do we always battle? What is the number one thing we always battle? So, we always battle our mind. We always battle this, this flesh. That's what we always battle. Yet later, Paul wrote, He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. And to Timothy, he stated in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have never the faith. As tough as it was to maintain victory, Paul found a way to do so. And if Paul could do it, why can't we? Paul, a very good example. I believe that we can, don't you? I believe that we can have revival, don't you? I believe that we can overcome our individual fears, don't you? I believe that we can overcome our individual issues, our church issues, don't you? I believe that we need each and every one here to overcome issues, right? As tough as it possibly is, we need each and every one. Amen? Amen. And if we would stand, I'm going to finish here. Let me just end like this. This is not a fight in flesh, but a fight in spirit. And as such, we need to understand how to fight a spiritual battle. We need to fight with spiritual training. We have great leaders in this church that have great minds. We have great minds in this building and in our organizations where we can, uh, we have great technology nowadays to, to get a hold of great teaching and great words that we have books and things like that to understand what is going on in the spiritual world, to be able to fathom and understand how to link. The biggest thing we need to know is we must know who our enemy is. Since it is a spiritual battle, we can't see our opponent. And we can't fight our enemy unless we know who he is. Every fighter trains differently depending on who their opponent is. We need to know the ins and outs of who he is. To be an overcomer, you need to learn and understand how he works. 
right? Amen. I would ask you here today to get ready to pray here, here today. God, help us be able. Help us be a great example to those looking up to us. Help us be great examples to those needing help. God, help us here today. Let's pray here right now. Father, you are adored here this, this morning, Lord Jesus, to where we've come to this place. We've come to this place, Lord, to, to understand, Lord Jesus, that we can overcome anything with you. That we can overcome, Lord Jesus, because we know who has the answers. We know who has written the book, and we know the end result. God, I ask you here today, Lord Jesus, to allow us to keep in our minds that we are overcome. Keep in our hearts that we can overcome anything with Christ. That we can overcome any battle with you. God, let's not take this life for granted, Lord Jesus. Let us live by example to where those that we don't know that need our help, Lord Jesus. Our testimony that you have uh, given us to where we can help others with, Lord Jesus, to through our walk and through our, our uh, your word, Lord Jesus, through your word. God, this uh, opportunity here today, Lord, to feel your presence, to feel your power, to feel your passion for your people, Lord Jesus, and, and to allow, and you still wanting your church to grow. You are still on the throne. You are still the King of kings and the Lord of lords throughout any fight. Throughout any struggle, Lord Jesus, you are still that one, God, that is the great physician, that is beautiful for every situation, that is the healer of healers, the king of kings, and the lord of lords, the alpha, the omega, the beginning, and the end. God, you've written, we know that you have written the word from cover to cover, Lord Jesus, you have, have um, penned excellency, Lord Jesus, that we can run to and have in our hands, Lord Jesus, that we can refer to God and get encouragement to continue to be overcomers. God, I lift up hand, my hand, Lord Jesus. I lift up my heart here this morning to give you thanks, to give you praise, to give you honor, to give you glory that is truly due to your name. I magnify your name. I love you. You Lord Jesus, I glorify you. In Jesus' name, let's give the Lord a hand.